everybody, here we are with uh, Michael Lloyd again, because I think that this is our third or fourth interview, and I love this man that is a psychologist, psychotherapist, and probably, in my opinion, one of the best brief psychotherapy in the world. Hello, Michael, again. <laughs> Hello. Oh, thank you very much. That's very nice. Thank very you. Kind of Thank you for being here again. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to have um, a chat with you, talking with you about psychotherapy. And um, today we talk about, uh, with Michael, we talk about brief psychotherapy to understand something behind. Brief psychotherapy is something behind uh, some brief psychotherapies. So, Michael, um, are you ready? Yes. Okay. I'm looking behind your shoulder. I see a book, the Uncommon Case Book about Milton oh. Erickson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good book. And you suggested me that book. It's, it's an, an incredible yeah. book. Everybody should yeah. read Uncommon Therapy, Uncommon, um, Uncommon Case Book. Yeah. Yeah. Dino Hanlon. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So, about brief psychotherapy. Um, my first question is, how can psychotherapy became brief? I mean, uh, in your book, Brief Psychotherapies, that now we have the Italian translation, Psychotherapy and Brevi, fantastic. You describe some interesting point about how psychotherapy became brief. Can you okay. give us uh, just an idea? Okay. How did therapy become brief? Yeah. I usually think of psychotherapy as starting with Freud in the 1890s and 1900 and then onward. As I wrote in the book, Brief Psychotherapies, uh, I gave a little history. Freud's early cases were brief. Sometimes they were even single session, like Katarina and Gustav Mahler, and then they became longer and longer. So maybe the better question is, why did therapy become long instead of why is it brief? Yeah. Become long. Well, psychoanalysis was just developing then, and it was largely a research instrument. And they found that if the therapist remained passive and didn't say very much and let the therapy go on and on, interesting phenomena seemed to emerge. Transference and the Oedipal complex and this kind of an idea. So some early efforts to have the therapist be more active and focused were tried notably by Otto Rank and Sandor Ferenczi. Uh, uh, but some of their methods were questionable. Uh, in a couple of cases, they had a patient sit on their lap, yeah. for instance. Uh, and the time wasn't right for revisionism yet because psychoanalysis was still trying to establish itself. Even yeah. Freud, in his last great paper, which is called Analysis Terminable and Interminable, but it could also be translated as analysis finite or endless, even Freud was complaining about there was relatively limited therapeutic benefits and he wanted the development of new methods that would use some psychoanalytic principles. So um, moving ahead in the history, a major influence toward briefer therapy was World War II. Until then, psychotherapy was mostly a long-term luxury for the well-to-do people, but the war was on and there were soldiers who were shell-shocked, now we would say they had PTSD, and they needed to be taken care of, and if possible they needed to be uh, uh, helped so they could return to the fighting. Uh, so several things resulted. One thing was psychologists became genuine therapists. Until then, psychologists mostly did psychological testing and social workers mostly did home visits to see how the children were. But that ther they needed more therapists, so psychologists and social workers became active clinicians, became real therapists. A second was group therapy became much more popular. The idea of being more efficient, we'll see 12 people or eight people at one time. And in the United States, the Veterans Administration, VA, it's called Veterans Administration Medical Centers, started to take care of all the veterans. And these became training uh, and research sites, and a lot of shorter term therapy was being done there. More emphasis was getting put on coping, 
ego functions, on efficiency, uh, and on reality factors like money and return to work. All those things became more important. Right after World War II, in 1946, uh, Franz Alexander and Thomas French wrote a very important book called Psychoanalytic Therapy um, Theory and Application. Uh, it was called. They coined the phrase, the corrective emotional experience. They recommended that the therapist would change his behavior or her behavior to fit the particular patient. Sometimes you would be strict, sometimes you would be more indulgent to try to give the person the experience they needed, a corrective emotional experience. So they were beginning to suggest different approaches with different people. At the same time, in the 1950s, different workers were exploring ways to make psychodynamic therapy more efficient and more effective. And at the same time, Fritz Perls was working on Gestalt therapy, Albert Ellis was developing rational emotive behavior therapy, which was the first really systematic form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, Eric Byrne was developing transactional analysis. So there were lots of things going on in the early 1950s. They wanted to find some way to make therapy faster, better, more effective than just long-term psychoanalysis. Especially for our interests, in the early 1950s, Gregory Bateson, who was an anthropologist and a philosopher, he was studying communication. And he got a research grant, and he sent Jay Haley and John Weakland to see what this fellow, Milton Erickson, yeah. was doing in Arizona. So this led to a whole different ways of thinking about problems and solutions. Cybernetics and interpersonal influence, these ideas. Looking at what was going on in the present that maintained a problem, rather than assuming problems resided in the individual's past. Erickson also changed the emphasis from the unconscious being a place of conflicts and problems to a place of unappreciated capacities yeah. and potential solutions. All that led to the idea of utilization. Haley eventually, uh, Haley was the first editor of Erickson's collected papers, and then eventually Haley edited these three volumes of conversations with Milton Erickson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then, moving ahead a little bit more, the Mental Research Institute, MRI, in Palo Alto, was founded in the 1960s by Don Jackson, who had worked with Harry Stack Sullivan. Harry Stack Sullivan was famous for the interpersonal theory of psychiatry. Richard Dick Fish started to direct the Brief Therapy Center. Uh, Haley and many other people were there. I have a list here. Paul Watzlewicz, John Weakland, Chloe Madonis, Virginia Satir, <clears throat> other people like R.D. Lang, Irving Yalom, Salvador Mnuchin, they all came to visit. Yeah. Years later, I once asked Jay Haley, why did you call it Brief Therapy? And he said, well, it's mostly just to make it different than long-term therapy. <laughs> psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, Steve DeShazer and Insu Berg also studied at MRI and met there. Uh, in 1982, Steve wrote a book called Patterns of Brief Family Therapy, and he was really doing strategic therapy. They were assigning directives that would counter different behavior problems. Uh, later, he got more interested in solution formation and developed solution-focused brief therapy. I should say, uh, the first time I taught at MRI some years ago, on the wall in the seminar room facing me while I looked at the audience, on the wall were photos of Don Jackson, Gregory Bateson, Milton Erickson, Jay Haley, Paul Watzlawick, John Weakland, Dick Fish, Virginia Satir, and other first generation luminaries. It was overwhelming. Like my heroes in my bibliography were looking at me and watching me. Very nervous, I remember that. Uh, some years later, in the United States, there was the managed care movement, which was had to do with insurance. But the managed care, and I wrote about it in a book called Brief Therapy and Managed Care. Uh, uh, sometimes there were a lot of problems with managed care. Sometimes I called it mangled care. But what, but what was a messed up or mangled care? But in terms of brief therapy, what was important was there was a further emphasis being put on getting results and accountability. Yeah. In 1988, 
The Milton H. Erickson Foundation had the first brief therapy conference. They held it in San Francisco. I was there, and my co-presenters, Moshe Talmud uh, and Bob Rosenbaum, were there, and we gave our first paper on single-session therapy, and that turned into the book Single Session Therapy by Moshe Talmud, right? Uh, and there have been many conferences since. The next brief therapy conference, as you know, Flavio, will be in December this year in a couple months, yeah. and you will be as a presenter, and so will I, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah.